but I think we're going to get started. I think we've got the, the last um, people coming in. And um, again, this is a really exciting portion um, of our of really of our community. And it's um, all due to Tom Exler's vision and insight into what it's like um, to be born and grow up with this condition. And he is a long-term community member um, with the Association for the Bladder Extrophy Community. He's actually the first person who um, brought me into this group. Um, and that's why I'm here today. And he's also been a, a longtime board member and volunteer. And he founded the Courage to Shine, which um, really um, provides recognition to the um, people living with this condition. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and um, let him introduce our award winner for this year. So how's everyone doing? Did they have a good lunch? Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. So I founded uh, the Courage to Shine website and, and awards back in 2010. And one of the reasons I, I founded it was to show true role models for today's teens and uh, young adults. And I think it's very important to show great role models. And one of the persons from the UK is going to be uh, Paul, um, Paul Young from the UK. So he's actually on our website now. Uh, since I founded uh, Courage to Shine, and we've had many responses from around the world, I, I get probably calls from all the time. And one of the examples was uh, a woman from Macau, China. She was a mother who just uh, had a baby, and she was um, about six weeks out of having, having a baby and was shipped off to Hong Kong. And she was very upset. But because I was actually at a conference with, from John Hopkins, there was, there was a doctor right next to me, and I said, will you take this case? And she was like, yes, I'll take this case. And it's, it's, it's good things. It's, it's a really another option of, of, of this organization. So we wanted to have a generic option. Um, and because of my, I have a bunch of Aussie friends here, we're the Aussie friends. Uh, the first award we gave out was to Tom Flood from in Australia, and he was an 80-year-old patient who, at um, he wasn't even done until he was in his 30s, and he was an amazing guy, and he's still alive today. So he's, he's I'm talking like he was in the past. But one, of, <laughs> one of the things that he, when I knew this was going to catch on was we got a letter from the Order of Australia. And it was about two years after I gave him the award. And it, it's a very high honor in Australia. And a high honor, right? Yeah. yeah. And because they gave that that award, I just thought, wow, I'm writing, writing this for a guy from Australia? It's just amazing. So, but this year's award winner I was lucky enough to meet back in, um, I never really met her, but I met, met down in 2005. And this was the article I actually saw. And in this article, I'm not gonna go with the details, I'm gonna let her speak, but it was something that was very interesting. So. We, so I got the information back, and this past year I said, where can I look her up? Well, when I looked her up and found her, this article was nothing compared to what I heard. And it's going to be an amazing to be able to see what she's accomplished in the last few years. So I'm going to introduce you to Brittany Douglas, and she's uh, this winner, this year's winner of the uh, Courage to Shine Award. And she's going to let, I'm going to let her speak and we'll see what she has to say. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. 
thank you, Tom, for inviting me to this event and for honoring me with this award. It's truly incredible. It's incredible to be here today um, to see all you guys come together and to build this bladder extra fee network. It's so important. And um, I'm going to continue to express that all throughout my speech today. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to come before you today and share my story with you. Because actually, this is going to be the first time that I'm sharing like this part of my story. I've never really told my bladder extra fee story to anybody publicly. So this is going to be the first. Um, so again, my name is Britton Douglas. I was born and raised not too far from here, just a couple hours south, uh, down in San Diego. Um, I actually have two professions. My full-time job, I work as a training coordinator for the electronic health records team for Sharpery Steeling Medical Centers. And then on the weekends, um, I'm a professional performer and DJ for Cebo San Diego. Yep, that's me, DJ Cotton Candy. <laughs> um, as well as DJ Brayton Kitten at the San Diego Zoo. <laughs> so uh, I graduated from the University of California, Santa Barbara with a bachelor's in sociology and I'm engaged to my best friend, Chris, who I've actually been dating for 17 years. Chris, you want to give everybody a wave? <laughs> <laughs> and we actually just got our first home together this past November, so that's really exciting. And he's actually sitting over by my wonderful parents, John and Karina Douglas. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for sitting here to speak today. But actually, you know, some of the most important things that you guys need to remember about me today is that I absolutely love glitter, cats, and Taylor Swift. <laughs> I know, I'm a loud speaker, sorry about that. <laughs> all right, um, so I'm here to share with all of you guys my story. So it's at this time that I warn you guys to buckle up your seatbelts because my life story has been one heck of a roller coaster ride. So, I was born um, on October 27th in 1986, and there wasn't anything special to be expected about my birth, other than I was going to be the second daughter to my parents. My initial due date was around Thanksgiving, November 23rd, and I did arrive a little over three weeks early, but that wasn't anything too surprising for my parents, considering that my sister had arrived like seven and a half weeks premature. My mom had taken all the appropriate prenatal care um, for both pregnancies, and never had to have an ultrasound for any reason. I was born at 3.30 in the morning, and I was announced that I was a baby girl. However, the doctor and nurses noticed that there was something wrong with me. There was tissue that was outside of my abdomen, and my legs dangled loosely on either side. Both my mother and father were in complete shock to hear what was coming next. The doctor that delivered me, along with the nurses, were very concerned with the appearance of my abnormal birth defect. They weren't sure what was wrong with me, and so they called a pediatric doctor to come quickly to attend to me. I was rushed away and placed in a sterile isolate. And I brought with you a picture. That's my dad and my, um, my older sister looking down at me um, in the isolate. The medical staff covered up that tissue on my stomach with a wet piece of gauze to keep it moist. The pediatric doctor was not able to tell my parents what was wrong with me because he didn't know either. He ordered a neonatal transport ambulance to deliver me to San Diego Children's Hospital immediately. Because I was delivered so quickly, my mom was actually still in her street clothes, so her and my dad hopped in the car and followed the ambulance to San Diego Children's Hospital, where they were hoping to find out what was wrong with me and hopefully find out that I was gonna be okay. Upon arrival at Children's, I was placed in the neonatal ICU. The news that was coming next for my parents is news that parents would never ever want to hear, but also news that I know many of you out here can relate to. A team of doctors, which included urologists and orthopedic surgeons, told my parents that I had something very rare called bladder extrophy, and that I had to have emergency surgery right away. They explained to my parents that between the fourth and sixth week of my development, my abdomen had closed with my bladder tissue outside of the body. My legs, were spread open like a frog because I didn't have a pelvis, a pubic bone, or stomach muscles, and my spine was malformed, and I had spina bifida. The doctors were not sure of the complexity of my birth defect and told my parents that I may not survive the surgery and that if I did, I most likely would not ever be able to walk and that I would definitely be living a compromised life. 
Now, this is just the beginning of my life and the story that I'm gonna share with you guys today. At four hours old, the surgery took 10 and a half hours. When it was done, my tiny little body was in a traction apparatus in an enclosed isolate with surgical tape rolls that were actually used as weights to manage the height of the pulleys. So here's a picture of what that looked like. And there's my mother there kissing my hand. The doctors performed an iliac osteotomy, taking muscle tissue from my left leg and cutting my butt bones in half to form a pelvis. They made me a bladder using the neobladder tissue and implanted my ureters into my kidney and my bladder. Now, back in 1986, there was little information regarding bladder extrapy. There was no Google, no search engine, nothing that could give my parents an idea of what this would all mean for them or for me. My parents had found a very small paragraph in a medical book and it didn't explain much of anything to them. After three weeks in the neonatal ICU, I was placed in a spike cast. <clears throat> Here are two pictures of what that looks like. And then this is my sister being such an amazing sister, already taking on her big sister role, taking really good care of me. As you can see, my legs were molded into a certain position and the body cast covered me from my ankles all the way up to my chest and my back. A tube was placed in my bladder that exited my stomach in the approximation of where a belly button would be, and a bladder bag hung on the side to capture my urine. The cast left a very narrow crack at my bottom so that my parents could clean me with those really long hospital butic swabs. And now every time my parents share that story with me, they let me know how very challenging it was. <laughs> um, so I was supposed to be in that cast for six weeks, However, given the typical growth of a newborn, that was, it was just not possible. And after two weeks, I had spiked 806 fever and was rushed to the ER. <coughs> I had developed a kidney infection, and so the spike cast had to be removed. I was hospitalized for pyelonephritis. For each month after that, I was hospitalized for more kidney infections. And finally, at six months, the doctors decided to reimplant my ureters. The constant pyelonephritis each month was endangering the health of my kidneys. Then at nine months old, I completely stopped breathing, became limp, and passed out in my mother's lap. I had suffered a febrile seizure because my temperature had rapidly spiked due to another kidney infection. My parents had to quickly call the paramedics and they raced me off yet again to San Diego Children's Hospital. At one years old, I was placed in a gait study to evaluate the orthopedic development of my ability to walk. And the surgical reconstruction that was done on me had appeared to be successful because I was walking. However, my life still required frequent hospitalizations, tests, and endless doctor appointments. I had become very familiar with living my life in a hospital setting with everyone examining my, my anatomy. My mother had to learn how to catheterize me in order to empty my bladder, which would then hopefully help to minimize those UTIs. And then I would eventually learn how to cath myself. At age four, the doctor scheduled further reconstructive surgery for me to form a bladder neck at, as well as enlarge my bladder. Now by now, I was very used to going to the hospital and considered it my second home. So getting prepared for another major surgery really didn't scare me. I had my pre-op blood drawn on a Friday and my surgery was scheduled for 7 a.m. the following Monday morning. I had even attended a birthday party on Saturday and was having a lot of fun, no concerns there. So as far as everybody knew, at the time I was healthy and prepared to undergo that surgery. However, that night, I suddenly woke up in excruciating pain at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. I crawled up onto my parents' bed and I told them that there was a knife in my stomach and that I needed them to take me to the doctors to get it taken out. My parents being super familiar with my current health issues, they placed me on the toilet, they took my temperature, they called the pediatrician, and my pediatrician, Dr. Lippman at the time, was on call at Palomar Hospital, and he advised my parents to bring me over immediately. He evaluated my symptoms, and he had my blood drawn. He told my parents that he was gonna go down to the lab to speed things along. Well, when he returned, he told my parents that they must take me to Children's Hospital right away. <laughs> He had already arranged the hematology doctors to see me there. Hematology, that was definitely not a specialty that we were familiar with. My parents later learned that Dr. Lippman had done his res residency in oncology 
and knew then what my parents were about to learn very soon. Upon arrival at the hospital, we were ushered into a private room and all the focus and attention was on me and it was great. It was like, wow, we're being treated like VIPs because we, I've been here so many times, so I'm getting the royal treatment, you know? Doctors, nurses, child life specialists, um, lab techs, they all scurried in and out of my room. And we repeated my symptoms and my issues to each and every one of them. A doctor to whom we hadn't met yet, her name was Dr. Allen, she came in and she actually asked my parents to step outside so she could talk to them. Now this was really odd and unfamiliar because my parents were always by my side when the doctors would come in and talk to me. Even after everything that we had already gone through together as a family with the bladder extra fee, there was just absolutely nothing that could prepare us for the piece of news that we were going to get next regarding my health. On March 10th in 1991, Dr. Allen told my parents this. She's very sorry to have to tell them this, but 69% of my blood was blast cells and that I had acute lymphocytic leukemia. My parents were shocked. They were left breathless and speechless. They thought, this had to be a big mistake. No, she's got bladder extrophy. We're dealing with bladder extrophy issues. There's just like no way that she could have cancer too. So now I was being scheduled for a bone marrow aspiration for Monday morning instead of my bladder surgery. And this was to, de to determine all the specifics of my new disease leukemia. Now there would be a new meeting that included oncologists and my parents to discuss what could be done to treat the leukemia. My bladder extrophy would now no longer be the primary focus of my health care. Instead, I now needed to fight cancer. One of my parents' best friends was the first to donate her blood to me so I could get her platelets. My mom's brother, Uncle Craig, came down to help my parents understand all of this new information about leukemia and to help sort out the details and make some really serious decisions about a treatment plan for me. My parents were now in a position to make some really difficult decisions. They were presented with two protocols, a standard protocol and a study protocol. Now the standard protocol had a very limited success rate and the study protocol, well, it's a study protocol, so you're gambling with those odds there as well. The study protocol was with a pediatric oncology group that was pioneering advancements in treating leukemia. Now this would be a huge leap of faith as they didn't have any stats on long-term remissions. Either protocol was a major risk with no guarantee of survival. My parents chose the study protocol and were given a protocol book and committed to following it to the letter. The phase one was the intensive phase, which was the first 30 days of chemo in isolation in the hospital. Then the second phase required every other week inpatient and the weeks that I weren't inpatient, I was outpatient and still had to come back to the clinic to receive chemo and my other treatment. This protocol lasted for three long and grueling years. I had a hypnin tube that was placed in my chest that would allow for all the drugs and chemo to go straight to my heart. And actually, I brought along some photos to demonstrate that as well. Um, and here is a picture that shows, these, I have a couple of photos that are gonna show what my life was like at this time. Um, because I wasn't really allowed to go outside um, or play with other children. So they had this red tricycle that allowed for my IV equipment, my chemo equipment to attach onto it. And then I could just, you know, wheel around the hospital halls. <laughs> this next one is I was given a baby doll that had cancer too and she actually had a Hickman as well. So this is me learning how to uh, treat my baby doll that also had cancer with a Hickman. And then this next photo here shows my sister being yet again an amazing, awesome older sister and taking care of the Hickman here for me. I had to have oral chemo around the clock, spinal taps, constant blood draws, blood tests, and leg shots. I did lose my hair. Um, I have, and so this is me actually sporting the wig that my parents got for me. And then again on that red tricycle, that was my favorite. <laughs> um, I had to stay out of the sun. I couldn't live life as a normal four or five or six year old could. Uh, while having cancer, I couldn't go outside, I couldn't go swimming, I couldn't play like other kids could. And I couldn't be around animals like others could because I didn't have an immune system. And so I could easily get even sicker than I was and then possibly not recover. After those three really tough years, I made it into remission though. 
Remember I told you guys in the very beginning I was a major cat lover? Well, I had always wanted a kitten, and my parents would tell me once I was all better, I could actually get a kitten. And the best surprise of my life was on the car ride home after I was being told that I was in remission, they pulled off into an animal shelter, and I got to take home my very first kitten, and I named her Reenie, short for remission. <laughs> yeah, so I got the cat, and then I got to drive her home. <laughs> Um, after completing the entire treatment plan by age seven, I needed to wait another year for my body to be clean from all the chemo before we could proceed again with the bladder reconstructive surgery. I still needed that bladder augmentation because my neobladder that the doctors had made for me originally didn't grow with me. So I was still living with a baby sized bladder and I still needed a bladder neck for continency and intermittent catheterization. In the meantime, me and my family, we never wasted a minute. I was able to be in dance class and gymnastics with my sister, and I was finally healthy enough to go on my Make-A-Wish trip, which I got to go on a cruise from Walt Disney World to the Bahamas. And then at age nine, my surgery was set. Guess what? On the exact same date as I was diagnosed with leukemia, March 10th, but this time it's in 1996. My parents struggled with that cursed date and tried to convince my urologist, Dr. Packer, to schedule it on another date but he could not. A whole team of doctors had to be coordinated for this surgery, and Dr. Packer was soon moving back east, so it really needed to go on this date. Dr. Packer was confident in my state of health and felt that my recovery would go reasonably well. All right, everyone. Are you guys still wearing your seatbelts? <laughs> because get prepared, the next nine months was an extremely bumpy ride. The next few pictures do really expose me, but it gives you a good idea of the experience of what I went through of going to hell and back. I'm not gonna keep him up here for very long due to how much it exposes me, but it just kind of gives you a preview to see um, where I've been. I think these pictures kind of speak for themselves. But I do have to say, Dad, in this one, you look really good. <laughs> <laughs> so the fight for my life continues. After the surgery, I suffered from a lot of complications. Peritonitis, appendicitis, pancreatitis, more pyelonephritis, uh, bowel obstructions, kidney failure. Yeah, it's a long list, and I'm sure I did name everything. I was bedridden because I was too weak and frail to get out of bed. I lost a bunch of weight. This is kind of showing that. Um, I was in constant pain for nine and a half months. My sister, this is a picture of my sister helping me to relearn how to walk because I was bedridden for so long, um, my body couldn't hold me up. So I was in excruciating pain for this whole entire nine and a half months. The pain medication could no longer even touch my pain. My body did become addicted to those pain meds. I even suffered from something called the uh, conversion reaction where I couldn't see for a period of time because my body began shutting down. On October 27th of 1996, I celebrated my 10th birthday in the hospital, violently throwing up and in excruciating pain. The chief of surgery then removed a portion of my intestines that were obstructed at the time. Then in November, I was sent home with a nasal gastric feeding tube, an IV, and a pig line because at this time, there was nothing else that they could do. I was so miserable that I was begging for my mom that if she loved me, that she would get a gun and shoot me. It was devastating to hear my mom and dad, or it was devastating to my mom and dad because there wasn't anything else that they could do to help me. It was a painful realization that I was going home to die. It was frustrating dealing with all the medical devices at home. My NG tube kept getting clogged. Then my mom would have to feed the tiny little wire that comes packed with it, she would shove it down to unplug the boost food that would get stuck in there because I didn't want to have to make another trip to go back to the hospital to have it taken out to put, be put back in. One day I was just so over it all that I pulled out my NG tube and I pulled out my IV. It was a slow but transformative event because I finally began eating and keeping food down I started to rehabilitate with physical therapy, exercising in a pool, and by Christmas, we celebrated a joyous recovery from a very lengthy hospital stay. 
However, the pain in my kidneys never seemed to end. Between middle school and high school, I kept myself busy with dancing and I got into musical theater and I even became Miss Preteen of Escondido 2000. Oh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, isn't this such a contrasting photo then? Just a few years prior to that, what I looked like. By the time I began high school, I was stricken with severe paralyzing kidney pain and was hospitalized for several weeks during my freshman year. There wasn't any treatment that could resolve this pain at this time. Even though I struggled with UTIs and kidney pain, I lived it up in high school as much as I possibly could. I was a four sport athlete. I played tennis, water polo. I was on the swim team. And then I was the JV uh, cheer team captain my, so uh, in my sophomore year. And then my senior year, I was um, the varsity cheerleading captain. I was in AP and honors classes. And in ASB, I was the pep rally commissioner and the head of my junior prom committee. When I graduated from high school, I believe that it was probably one of the most proudest moments for me and my family because that was the day that we thought that I would never ever see. But I made it. <laughs> I was able to see my urologist at Children's up until I went to college. And that was the scary part, going away to college, because I chose to go pretty far away. Well, within the state at least, but I chose to go to the University of California, Santa Barbara. So then I had to establish care at UCSD, but during my sophomore year of college, I had another complete bowel obstruction. Now, since I was up at UCSB, it was four hours north from all the medical facility, facilities that knew me and my situation. The small hospital up in Goleta was not equipped what, with what they needed to to perform my surgery with my complicated anatomy. The decision was made to bring me down to UCSD and for the immediate malobstruction surgery. My mom raced up to Santa Barbara and picked me up. She knew that there was a chance that I wouldn't make it back to San Diego alive, but at least she would have been in the car with me. The surgery was a success and the surgeon explained to my parents that it had looked that someone, like someone had spilled a whole bottle of Instaglue inside of my intestines. That's how bad the scar tissue was. On my 21st birthday, I had another complete bowel obstruction, which ended in another surgery. What a surprise, right? So I didn't get to party like the others got to celebrating turning 21, but my birthday was unique and special in its own way. My fiance, who was my boyfriend at the time, and my sister, they brought in shots of water that were colored with food dye to make it look like fancy celebratory uh, 21st birthday shots. <laughs> That's just how my family rolls. They never miss a chance to celebrate no matter where we are and what we're doing. So shots of water is what we cheer with. During this time, my kidney pain was more than I could take. A friend of ours, referred us to a pediatric urologist up at Stanford named Dr. Kennedy. He was specializing in bladder atrophy up at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Kennedy agreed to take me on and he began his gamut of tests. A stint was placed in my left ureter and I had a drainage bag that I had to carry around with me during my last two semesters of college. There wasn't any good conclusive findings from any of these tests and I just wanted them to take my kidney out but they would not do that. Dr. Kennedy agreed to perform an exploratory surgery to see if he could find anything because I was in so much pain all the time. What he did discover was a duplex ureter that was hidden and coiled up underneath my ovary area and had been the source of my pain all of these years. It was having reflux in that ureter. After that surgery, I began my road to recovery without kidney pain. <laughs> Now, while this was all happening during my college years, I did continue my life doing the best that I could. I was on the college cheerleading squad. I was in a sorority, I was in Kappa Alpha Theta. And dealing with all of this was definitely very challenging and difficult as I tried to attend as much class as I could to keep up with my peers. But when I had reached my fourth year of college, I had missed so much class and I wasn't aware of it because I was so sick that uh, I had to get the dean to agree to allow me to take twice as many classes as the regular student the regular student had to for at least two more semesters. And those two semesters 
were the same two semesters that I was troubleshooting my kidney pain with that bladder bag on my side. But I was determined to walk on time. It was a really, really big deal to me. I had to get that dean to approve, and he did. It took a lot of convincing, but he did once he heard my story. I did it. By the summer of 2009, I was able to walk with my, graduate, my college graduating class at UCSB. After this hurdle, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing for me. I had to get off of all the pain medication that I was on at this time, and that was tough. After a few years of trying to get off of them myself, my family had done some research on a place in San Diego that could help me. So on my 25th birthday, I was admitted into a rehab facility that promised me that they could successfully get me off of all the pain meds that I was addicted to. And those pain meds were fierce. Now, also at this time, I had just gotten cast in a show at Legoland, California. And I didn't want to jeopardize that, that opportunity for myself. So I made an arrangement with the doctor and my family where my family could co come and pick me up, take me to rehearsal or my show, and then deliver me back to the rehab facility at night. Nobody knew this really big secret. 30 days later, I was living my best life, starting my performance career at Legoland, that led me to then be working at SeaWorld San Diego, that then eventually led to me working at the San Diego Zoo as well. So this is me in my Legoland show, and then me when I started DJing at SeaWorld San Diego. However, the struggle never stops. My body has a way of keeping me on my toes. When making plans for my big 3-0 birthday, my family conspired to take me to Vegas so I could finally celebrate um, the way that I had wished that I could for my 21st. But right before my 30th birthday, I had another complete bowel obstruction. I ate Brussels sprouts, and that was the cause of that one. But this time I got to the hospital soon enough where they were able to decompress me with an NG tube and put me on bed rest for about a week. I was determined to get out of the hospital before I turned 30. <laughs> And I did. We made it to Vegas and we got to celebrate in style. I'm now 32 years old and I still have to be careful with my health. Issues of UTIs, bowel obstructions are always hovering at the forefront of my mind. I make sure to listen to my body for any signs of emergent issues. But each day that I wake up, I cherish it because I know how valuable it is to be alive and well. Everyone has something that they all have to deal with. And well, bladder atrophy and cancer was mine. Ever since I was little, I actually felt that I was blessed to have these issues. Even when I could be so angry because I wasn't normal like the other kids, I did feel that because of everything I have endured, I am blessed to value every day that I am given, and that mindset started at such an early age, and for that, I am really appreciative for, for the cards that I was dealt. A lot of people don't cherish life like this until it's too late. And everything that I've been through and overcame it just made me stronger and more determined to enjoy life like nobody else. People who meet me and learn about me and what I'm involved with often ask me, why are you so busy all the time doing all the things that you do? My response is, well, why not? We're not guaranteed tomorrow, and we need to make the most of today. I like to spend my extra time volunteering and giving back to my community and the organizations that helped me and my family during our really tough times. I had grown up attending a camp for children with cancer called Camp Reach for the Sky, and when I was 15, I could not wait to start getting back and volunteering for them. I soon became the program director for that day camp, and for the past three years, I've been the volunteer program director for their resident oncology camp. Actually, I'm heading up to this camp tomorrow as soon as this conference is over. And this is me actually being the program director last year. I'm dressed up as a, one of the camp songs, it's the Battle Shark Truce Buzzard. We like to get all dressed up and wacky at this camp. Whenever there is a chance to help and give back, I am there. And I hope that by me being here today and sharing my story with all of you, can help give you guys strength in your time of, of adversity. Well, I am wrapping it up here, and I would like to give a major shout out and thank you to my parents who came all the way up here from San Diego to watch me speak. I wanna thank you so much for being the, the strongest and most wonderful parents I could ever ask for. They've been my angels for 32 years, and I am who I am today because of them. 
And I want to thank my sister. She's not here today, but she was very instrumental in taking care of me as well, as you can see from all those photos. And thank you to my fiance for your ongoing support and love. It is because of my really strong support system that I have the courage to shine like this. <laughs> when I was growing up. And this is so valuable that we are all part of this bladder extrophy network together. This is truly incredible, and it's so incredible for all of you guys to be here today. Um, it's been an abs absolute pleasure getting to speak in front of all of you guys. If you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to ask me. I am an open book, so thank you guys so much for your time. <laughs>